Hi guys and welcome back to another Dot Race video and today we're going to be playing MotoGP 21. We are going to be using Takaki Nakagami here in Aston because we are about to do our MotoGP race recap of round 9 of here in Aston. So we were blessed with four Grand Prix in the Cathedral of Motorsport, one of the best tracks ever made. I absolutely adore Assen. It's such a such a great track. It's so so good. But we had four Grand Prix that equally all were very very entertaining. So we had Moto E, Moto 3, Moto 2, and Moto GP, of course. And we will be discussing all four of those categories in today's video. But starting off first with Moto E. Pretty good race, to be quite honest with you. It was difficult for me to watch Moto E. I do have a confession. I'm not fully aware of what all occurred in Moto E because I was a little bit sidetracked trying to watch British Superbike and MXGP at the same time. So I do apologise for missing a few bits out. But the important thing to know is Eric Granado was absolutely brilliant. Eric Granado winning against Jordi Torres and Alessandro Zaccone. And of course, Zaccone with the third place puts him at the top of the Moto E World Cup Championship by seven points clear of Jordi Torres and, of course, race winner Eric Granado. He's 17 points behind. But Dominic Egerto, of course, was probably the favourite to winning Moto E this season. He thought he's looked super good. He was competitive in World Supersport as well. The guy's on a great year so far. But unfortunately for him, he did crash out quite early on in the battle for, uh, for Assen victory, which was a really, really good battle in the sense of plenty of overtakes. Alessandro Zaccone was battling. Lucas Tulovic was battling it out. There was just so much carnage and contact going on. I really enjoyed the Moto E race, and usually, as a rule of thumb, a lot of people don't tend to watch Moto E because, of course, electronic bikes and whatnot. But the, um, the actual onboard action and the on-screen entertainment is really, really good. And, of course, you've got some great riders in there. You know, Granado, Torres, Zagone, Ferrari, Tulevich, Casadai. There's so many great riders. And, of course, Dominic Egerto, who we just mentioned earlier on. So if you haven't watched Moto E or you're thinking about watching it, I would highly recommend you jump on board and just try out some of these electronic bikes. It's not the best of things. And, of course, the commentary team is different to your usual team. But the majority of it is really good. And, of course, it's like a sprint race. So in Aston, we had like seven or eight laps of just men going for it 120% because they literally need to get out and go as quick as possible and get the victory as sooner rather than later. I would highly recommend Moto E, but we will now move over to Moto 3 because, of course, we have four Grand Prix to get through. We have quite a, quite a bit of news that I want to discuss from Moto GP. There's quite a lot going on in Moto GP right now, so I think it's best we move on quite sharply and get on with the other categories. So now time to discuss Moto3, quite possibly the most entertaining part of the weekend. Always, I absolutely adore Moto3. And of course, Dennis Foggia was taking this victory right here in Aston. He did an incredible job, absolutely incredible job this weekend. He looked so confident on board that Leopard Honda, and he didn't put a foot wrong during the race. There was a couple of occasions where he lost the lead and people were trying to get back on him and some riders were forcing wide and stuff, but he, he stayed focused. And he carried so much speed and momentum into the final sector that he was just unbeatable. You know, there was a lot of action in this Grand Prix. Of course, shout out to Pedro Acosta from being in a hospital bed in the morning and then taking a incredible fourth place finish. Technically a fifth place finish, but we'll get to that in a minute. Sergio Garcia, Romano Fanati, both on the podium as well. So it's a great podium all around. I like seeing Sergio Garcia do well and doing well in other tracks because he was heavily criticised of just being able to perform on his own track. Good to see Romano Fanati back on it. I know a lot of people have mixed feelings about Romano Fanati since the old Stefano Manzi pulling of the brake incident in Mazzano a couple of years ago. But I think he's matured a lot. However, you could say that he hasn't matured because he got a double long lap penalty for uh, aggressive riding <laughs> in the practice sessions. So technically, I guess you could say he hasn't matured. But the way he rode in Assen, the way he calmly took his double long lap penalty and was smart about the race and was able to fight to the very end for a victory. I was very impressed with Romano Fanati. I, I did feel like he has taken a step forward in the sense of maturity and he's grown up quite a lot. Thumbs up from Dr. Ace. And of course, Darren Binder, wow, he had a really tough, tough race. Not the race I expected from the South African at all. And things could only get worse for Darren Binder right now, unfortunately. But he did a amazing save going into the second to final corner, which I don't think was captured very well. He literally was out of his seat. I jumped at home and I was very, very concerned that I thought he was going to high side. 
but thankfully he stayed on board the motorcycle, fought back tremendously with the uh, top guys again, just missed out sort of podium potential, but he was fighting with uh, the best of Pedro Acosta and Tatsuki Suzuki, actually did a double, a double overtake into the Gert Timmer chicane right at the end and took fourth place. However, he did apparently touch the green on the exit of Duca Sloot and therefore was given track limit penalty of three positions, which I'm so confused by because I thought it was only ever one position, but allegedly he lost three positions on one touching of the green. I mean, my heads are in my hand. I don't know. I don't know about that one. That seems silly. I thought it was. I thought the rule was it was just one demotion. Not three, but hey, that's one thing to discuss. And some uh, bad news for the experienced Italians in Moto3. Andrea Mino and Nicolo Antonelli, the VR46 Academy boys, both crashing in an incident in Strubben. I think they touched the rear of uh, Kai to Toba. Toba made a bit of a mistake. Antonelli touched his rear tyre. Mino touched his rear tyre. And then, unfortunately, the two Italians went down. Difficult circumstance into Strubben because it won't be the first time we'll be discussing an incident into Strubben in today's Grand Prix video. And of course, Nicolo Antonelli did crash, but got back on the bike. He remounted and took 14th place. So two points are better than nothing. So great job there for Nicolo Antonelli. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for Andrea Mino. Had to retire the lap after. Adrian Fernandez was the only other crasher of the weekend, or the, at least the race session, let's say. And that pretty much sums up Moto3. So Dennis Foggia wins quite demandingly with Sergio Garcia and Romano Fanati taking the podium. Now time to discuss Moto2. Now on to the black sheep, let's say, of MotoGP's categories. Most people don't tend to watch or don't tend to enjoy Moto2 as much as the likes of MotoGP or Moto3. And in the past, yes, Moto2 has been a little bit boring. But the same cannot be said for the Aston race. I thought that was a very, very smart tactical and very fair race between all four men. There was four potential winners in Moto2 in yesterday's race. Ultimately, Raul Fernandez, Remy Gardner and Augusto Fernandez finished on the podium and Sam Lowe sadly missed out, so bad news for us Brits. However, this was a very competitive race from Augusto Fernandez leading, from Raul leading, from Sam Lowe's leading and from Remy Gardner leading. There was a, quite a lot of good aggressive overtakes, there was a lot of fair overtakes and there was a lot of sort of working each other out. It was a very tactical race, and of course it wasn't overtakes in every other corner, but it was a very entertaining one nonetheless. So I was very pleased to see Raul Fernandez bounce back from Saxon Ring. Of course, crashing out the first time this season must have been very difficult for the young Spaniard, but it's good to see he bounced back extremely well, and in what a fashion to do it. Sam Lowe's looking pretty good. Didn't look like he had enough to fight for the podium towards the end of the race, but he still looked pretty promising. Augusto Fernandez, brilliant to see Augusto Fernandez battling up there. The last time I seen Augusto Fernandez was really competing was probably before Aragon a couple of years ago. He was so competitive and it really looked like he was going to be the next big thing in Moto2. Potential going up to Moto GP even. But unfortunately, something happened to him. He had lost his confidence, started making a couple of mistakes during the Grand Prix, and things just didn't materialise for Augusto Fernandez. So it's great to see him bounce back as well, to see him competing at the front and just being competitive. It's good to see. It's always great to see a comeback story in MotoGP. So massive thumbs up and massive props to Augusto Fernandez. And of course, Remy Gardner still riding the wave, riding the lots and lots of momentum the surfer boy is. He is loving life right now in the Red Bull KTM team. Taking second place to Raul Fernandez. I don't think he was too impressed with that, but he can't be mad. He's only dropped five points and still leads the championship more than comfortably going into the summer break. So you can't be mad if you're Remy Gardner. I certainly wouldn't be if I was Remy Gardner. So I mentioned earlier we would be discussing turn five of Assen Strubben, and we are going to mention it once again because, of course, there was another incident in that very, very tight left-hander. Lorenzo Dallaporta bumping into the side of Jorge Navarro ended his Grand Prix early and he was making his way back over to the pits way quicker than anyone even finished a lap. It was very, very difficult to watch. It seemed to be a little bit of a mistake on his part, but also at the same time, two people wanted the same piece of tarmac. Difficult situation for Lorenzo Dallaporta. I did expect him to jump up to Moda 2 and be very competitive. Not really had a decent race yet from Lorenzo Dallaporta, which is very, very harsh and sad to say, but unfortunately it is reality. Hopefully he can figure things out and start being a bit more competitive 
Now, speaking of another former Moto3 rider, Tony Arbolino, one who sort of has got it right in Moto2 and is getting better and better at the championship. However, he crashed out in a very fast corner in Turn 7. Very difficult moment for Tony Arbolino, crashing very, very hard into that corner. Of course, it's a very, very fast corner, that one. And he really barrel-rolled it into that one. A little bit concerning, but he was okay, thank goodness. And we have had news about them being fine, so fingers crossed he's back on the motorcycle soon. But of course he does have the summer break to sort of rest and unwind. Bad news for you American fans, Joe Roberts not able to complete the race, unfortunately for him. Crashing out with 17 laps. Very, very sad to see the American struggling once again. He didn't look too happy, he didn't look too confident here in Aston, which surprised me quite a bit, but... I'm sure he'll bounce back after the summer break and get some valued rest for the American. I'm sure this season there will be a podium on offer for him sooner or later, but it's just a matter of when, not a matter of if. Grassini bound Fabio Di Giantonio crashing out in a fierce battle with Marco Bezzecchi for fifth place. Not the weekend for Fabio Di Giantonio. Looked like he had a lot of pace and a lot of things to offer in today's Grand Prix, or yesterday's Grand Prix, should I say, but unfortunately for him, ended early. Not quite the Grand Prix that he was hoping. Not really seen the best of Fabio Di Giantonio since his win early on in the season and I'm sure once again he will bounce back also. And bad news for Aaron Canet, another former Moto3 rider crashing out of the Aston Grand Prix. Canet looked great, he did lead the race a couple of times just early on in the race but unfortunately for him just went backwards after that point and so unfortunately Ending into the gravel. Not a great race for Aaron Connett, but again, as mentioned earlier, as the other riders, I'm sure he'll bounce back. He's done pretty well this season so far, and especially on the Bosca Scora chassis. You can't give Aaron Connett much of a fault here. The only fault I can give him is his tattoos. I think they're bloody horrendous. However, but that is a more personal statement rather than his actual riding ability. His riding ability is absolutely fantastic, though. So don't discount a potential Aaron Connett victory this season. The Bosco Scorer chassis is not looking too good compared to the Calyx. However, Aaron Connett's skill, I reckon he will finish in a victory position so at some point this season. But that pretty much confirms everything roughly about uh, Moto2. And of course, I want to have plenty of time to discuss MotoGP. But a final shout out to young Celestino Avet. Young Celestino Vietti, one of my favourite riders. I really enjoyed watching him in Moto3 and now he's up into Moto2. Not quite done the business as I expected. But it is good to see him take his first top 10 of the season, so great job to Celestino Vietti. And of course his teammate Marco Bezzecchi finishing in 5th place. He still holds on to 3rd place in the championship, although it's got a little bit thinner with Sam Lowe's taking a position ahead of him. And of course Raul Fernandez and Remy Gardner finishing in the top 2 positions. But that pretty much concludes Moto2 segment of today's video. I'm moving on quite swiftly because I really do feel we need to discuss MotoGP. There is quite a lot to discuss. And who knows if we're going to be able to put everything to bed. But right now, let's crack on with the discussion. So first and foremost, Fabio Quattararo winning in tremendous fashion here in Assen. Dominant from pretty much the beginning. He had a bit of a battle with Peko Bagnaia, but he did a tremendous job. A really superb job to getting out to the front and taking victory ahead of Maverick Vinales and Joan Mir. Now, of course, we will be discussing Maverick Vinales, so just hold on a moment. But firstly, I wanted to mention the man on your screen right now, Taka Nakagami. I really felt that this was going to be the race for him. Hence the reason I have chose Taka for today. I really expected him to do really well during the Grand Prix. He was so competitive. He was fighting with Banyaya. He was fighting with Fabio Quattararo. He was doing a great job and he looked really confident. I expected this one to finally end the podium drought that Nakagami has had. But unfortunately, it didn't quite materialise. He has been heavily criticised for not surviving with the tyres or making bold choices with the tyres. And I think once again, it has backfired. Going for the soft option tyre did not pay dividends for the Japanese rider. But please don't fret. He will have a podium this season. He is so close in a lot of tracks and it's just a matter of getting it together. He'll get there this season, but I thought he deserved the MotoGP 21 race recap video slot since he did so well in Assen. Peko Bagnaia deserves a massive shout out as well. He was the only man who was really giving it to Fabio Quattararo. I feared and I really, really feared this that Fabio Quattararo was going to get to the front and then just disappear, do the old Lorenzo-esque style where they just chuck out the ridiculous lap times. And I really feared for this because Assen is one of those tracks that we get really good battles. And unfortunately for me, 
Quattro ruined it because I really wanted them to be going toe-to-toe -to -toe in every other corner because Assen offers a great amount of overtaking opportunities and just great battles in general. Now, of course, you can't be mad at Fabio for doing the business. He did exactly what he was supposed to do, get to the front and lead the race and just dominate from there. So amazing job from Fabio, as always, whenever he does that. But Pecco was really giving it to Fabio. He was the only man who was really able to hold him back but once Fabio got through started making some moves and started chucking in that Yamaha into those wider sweeping corners it was game over for Peko Banyaya and it was really game over for Peko when he abused the track limits too many times and was given the ugly long lap penalty and then Ducati's day went worse from there literally as Peko exited the long lap penalty Jack Miller threw his Ducati down onto the floor into Strubbin and ended his Grand Prix early as well he was one of the four crashes we had in Aston, which unfortunately I'm going to have to touch on now. Ducati's day got even worse as Jorge Martin crashed out as well. So of course you got Jack Miller not finishing, Jorge Martin, Peko Bagnaia giving a long lap penalty. Pretty bad day for the Ducati boys. The factory of Bologna will be very, very miffed with the result in Aston. And speaking of Italy, Valentino Rossi unfortunately crashed out into the Russian hook. Awful race for the doctor. The second the race started, having a horrendous start and going straight to the back of the grid behind Garrett Gerloff. Awful result for Rossi. Seeing him crash he quite heavily into turn seven, of course, the same scary crash that Tony Arbolino had earlier on. Very difficult scenes to watch, but he was absolutely fine. So granted, this could have been a very special race for Rossi. He loves the track. The grip has been great, he's been quite competitive all weekend and was only 5 tenths of a second down on the warm-up lap in the morning. So it, it looked to be the race that Rossi was going to be competitive, but unfortunately us Rossi fans weren't treated in yesterday's Grand Prix. Unfortunately that isn't all of the crashes today. Ika Lekona crashing out into the gear Tim a chicane. Quite late on as well, I did feel like Ika Lekona was doing a pretty decent job. He does look like he's getting better and better on board the KTM, but I do fear that Tech 3 KTM will not be continuing on with his services next season, especially when Remy Gardner is moving on his way up. And of course, talks of Raul Fernandez joining Remy Gardner in MotoGP as well. Things aren't looking too grand for Ika Lekuona, and the way he was sort of leaning on the fence, it did look like he probably knows that it's going to be over very soon as well. But it's going to be a sad sight to see Ika Lekuona push back down to Moto2 or even into World Superbike perhaps. But now I guess I've not been stalling, you might be thinking I have, but we are going to get to it. We need to discuss Maverick Vinales. Now a lot of people think that Maverick Vinales is an absolute enigma. True, I think he is as well. However, his body language screamed everything we all thought at the weekend. He told us without even uttering a word that he was not staying with Yamaha next season. You could tell in the body language on the podium. Probably one of the most awkwardest podiums I've ever seen. This should have been a really special moment for Maverick because he's not been on the podium since early on in the season when he won in Qatar. So this should have been something really exciting. It should have been something he should have been elated about. But he looked absolutely miserable. The first thing I thought is that something's not right here with Maverick. There's something not right with the situation, with the team and himself. It's clearly not happy times right now in Yamaha. It really isn't. Now, a lot of people were criticising Maverick to say that, oh, he's on the podium, he should just grow up and stop being a crybaby. But at the end of the day, he's still a human being and he is passionate about what he does. He is so passionate about what he does and what he is doing that he is obviously sticking to his decision to move on from Yamaha and to stick with not celebrating with the team. We don't know a lot of things, but what we can say and we can surmise is that he wasn't happy on the podium, he wasn't happy with Yamaha, and it is not going to get fixed until he moves on. So of this time of recording this video, Maverick Vinales and Yamaha have agreed to split ways for next season. Allegedly this has come from Maverick Vinales, he has asked for the split, and we don't know where Maverick Vinales is going to go. There is now rumours of Maverick Vinales potentially joining the Aramco VR46 team with Valentino Rossi's bikes. I'm not quite sure on what's going on with MotoGP right now. It definitely looks like next year is going to be the silly season. My biggest fear that Valentino Rossi will not ride next season is probably true. And I don't think we will see potentially Maverick Vinales on a Aramco VR46 bike. I don't see that coming. I do probably link him with Aprilia. Do we see Davizioso come back to full-time racing? Maybe he joins the Yamaha? Does Franco Morbidelli finally get that factory Yamaha that he desperately deserves? 
Will Marco Bezzecchi finally be moving up to MotoGP to join Luca Marini and the Aramco VR46 team? It seems to be what's been planned. Is that going to change now with Maverick Vinales going to that team? Is Raul Fernandez going to be making his way up with Remy Gardner into the Tech 3 KTM team? Will we no longer see Danilo Petrucci and Valentino Rossi in MotoGP next season? There is so many questions for next season that I cannot wait for it to start already. And of course, I'm already going to be suffering with MotoGP withdrawal symptoms very, very soon because, of course, it is the summer break. Thankfully, we do have World Superbike and <laughs> British Superbike to keep me entertained. But right now, lack of MotoGP after today's Grand Prix. But guys, there is so many questions and little, little answers. Let me know in the comment section down below what you think is going to happen. Also, let me know what your fantasy in MotoGP is. So what would you like to see? If you had the complete control over everything, where would you put each rider? For me, I would really like to see Valentino Rossi ride in his own team next year on the factory Ducati. It's an opportunity that I really think he should take. I would like to see Marc Marquez on a factory KTM or Suzuki. I think that could be a totally different experience that we've never seen before. Personally, I would like to see Marquez just try another bike. I would like to see how he gets on. Like Danny Pedrosa, I would have loved to have seen him on a Yamaha. I think with his smooth riding ability on a Yamaha would have been so good to watch. I'm going to chuck in Maverick Vinales on a factory Honda and maybe even Johan Zarco. I know Zarco covered for Nakagami a couple of years ago and did a decent job. So I'm curious to see how this would sort of work out. But I need to get back to the business because I've been on a bit of a tangent there. I want to mention Alex Rins going into Mandevin into turn 10. Unfortunately, Johan Zarco ended his race quite early. Now, Alex Rins stayed on board the motorcycle but wasn't able to compete for anything too particularly special. He did finish in 11th place. But I did see his name tumble down the timing sheets and I did fear that he had crashed out once again. Of course, Alex Rins on a horrendous streak right now. But thankfully for him, he did finish the race in the 11th. And of course, big shout out to the American, Garrett Gerloff. How have I not mentioned Garrett Gerloff yet? Jumping on there in a two or three year old Yamaha and finishing in 17th. He even managed to battle it out with the runner up of the Motor 2 World Championship, Luca Marini. Great stuff to see Garrett Gerloff in there. Maybe I should put Garrett Gerloff in one of my uh, fantasy rides as well. But I would definitely like to see top rank. Razgati Oglu in a factory Yamaha. I think he deserves the opportunity as well, but who knows what's going to happen in the near future. Last mention as well to Miguel Oliveira. Didn't really see much of Oliveira in this one. I did expect to see him more towards the front and battling out for a good victory. Now, he did try and chase down Peko Banyaya, and I think he got past Peko in the end. And then, of course, Johan Zarco trying to get through on him, but was two seconds behind. Not quite the result. For Miguel Oliveira but guys that is pretty much going to conclude today's video I think I've discussed pretty much everything I want to discuss there's of course there's always more things to talk about so let me know in the comment section down below if you want to chat about anything I'm always available for a good MotoGP chat so let me know in the comment section down below I hope you guys have enjoyed the video if you did like comment and subscribe hit the notification bell to be alerted to every single dot trace upload and upon that note guys thank you for watching and ciao for now oh hi didn't quite see you there Good to see you're still here. If this video didn't quite set your appetite, then why not watch some more Dot Trace content by clicking the video shown on screen now. Furthermore, if you would like to follow me on social media, you can do so now with the links down in the description. Consider subscribing so you don't miss a single Dot Trace video.